Hello and welcome to part 5 of the Mandalorian Armor audiobook. Before we continue chapter 11 where we left off in our last part, I'd like to just talk to a few people from the comments. First off, I'd like to say hi to Xana Minx, who said, Simp for Daddy Fett. Well, <laughs> indeed, aren't we all? And then I would also like to mention a Big Bird, who's given us a couple of comments. Thanks very much for coming and talking to us, Big Bird. First, uh, Big Bird says, You should listen to the original audiobook to get a feel for how to talk like Boba Fett even better. He talks more nonchalant. Well, thanks very much for the recommendation. Um, I am trying to base this mostly off of uh, Temuera Morrison's performance in the TV show. Um, however, it's interesting to hear that he's more nonchalant than that. I'll try and take on that note. I'm not going to listen to the original audiobook, partly because this is something different. And I think, you know, I want it to be something different. Also, I'm really enjoying just discovering the book as I go. So I don't want to be spoiled before I continue it here on the channel. Um, also, Big Bird then also said that the, the EU is really something that can never happen again. It's before the wokeness virus took over and made it impossible for the best talent to rise to the top. Now, I have to say I don't particularly uh, agree with you, Big Bird. I don't think that there's a wokeness virus that's taking things over and ruining things and certainly not preventing talent from rising to the top. Um, the idea that the EU is something that can't happen again is an interesting one because I think you are both correct and potentially incorrect in a way, because I think you're right, we're not going to get the same sort of stories that we have in the current EU. Um, however, I do believe that we will get something similar. We're getting something similar already. You know, we can see with, say, um, the, oh, now what is it called? The High Republic, that's it. So um, a place where we're building a lot more law, we're building a lot more stories, and they are new, and they're going to be part of the new landscape of Star Wars. It's very important to remember, I think, for any form of fandom, we're not losing anything, we're only gaining. So it's going to be really interesting to see where that goes. Thanks very much for joining Big Bird, I really hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, audiobook. And lastly, I'd like to say hello to Sean Morgan, who said, I really enjoyed your reading of this story. Your voice has a quality to it that I can only describe as something like Stephen Fry, thank you very much, combined with Simon Whistler. And, as a fun aside, Simon Whistler is not a fan of Star Wars at all, so hearing a voice so similar to his is reminiscent of Bill Burr, who's an outspo outspoken Star Wars detractor and would become a rather significant character on The Mandalorian. And yes, I was very surprised to hear that Bill Burr was such a Star Wars uh, detractor. Simon Whistler, I'm not terribly familiar with Simon Whistler. I will go and find out more about Simon Whistler now. But thank you so much for your kind words. I hope you're sticking with us and I hope you're really enjoying it. Now, let's carry on with the rest of the audiobook. Chapter 11 continued. The Twi'lek Major Domo had other household duties as well, chief among which was spying. Your son has just concluded a long conversation with Boba Fett. All the comings and goings in the Bounty Hunter Guild headquarters were observed by Ob Fortuna. From what I could tell, your son seemed rather pleased with the results. I'm not surprised. Kradosk's blunt claws fumbled with the catches of his ceremonial robes. The heavy fabric, with embroidery that depicted his species' ancient battles and triumphs, was stained with the wine that had been spilled at the banquet. Bast gets his eloquence from me. He shrugged off the robes. Persuasiveness is a speciality of his. But aren't you concerned? The Twi'lek's tapering headtails swung forward as he gathered up the robes. About what the two of them found to talk about? He spread the robes out on a lacquered rack at the side of Kradosk's sitting room. Your son has, shall we say. The Twi'lek's smile was a combination of nerves and obsequiousness. A bit of a conspiratorial streak. Of course he does. He wouldn't be my son otherwise. Kradosk sat down on the edge of a canopied pallet and stuck his legs out. His claws ached from all the standing he'd had to do, giving toasts and welcoming the famous Boba Fett into the Brotherhood of Bounty Hunters. I don't expect him to take over the leadership of the guild someday, merely because he has a talent for killing sentient creatures. The Twi'lek knelt down to unfasten the metal-studded straps laced between Kradosk's claws. I think, he said softly, 
that your son is rather eager to assume that leadership, perhaps even impatient. Good for him. Keeps him hungry. Grados leaned back against a mound of pillows. I know just what my son wants. The same thing I did when I was his age. Blood leaking through my fangs and a pile of credits in my hand. Oh. Ob Fortuna's eyes glittered at any mention of credits. But perhaps it would be better for you to be careful. Better for me to be smart, you mean. I don't intend to wind up on my son's dinner plate. That's why I'm on his side in all of this. The head tails rolled across the Twi'lek's shoulders as he looked up. I don't understand. You wouldn't. You're not a sneaky enough barb. It takes a Trandoshan to understand the subtleties of these kind of maneuvers. We are born with it like scales. Do you really think I'm such an idiot that I'd let Boba Fett walk in here and become a member of the Bounty Hunters Guild and just take everything he has to say on trust? Gradosk had no anxiety about revealing his thoughts and schemes to his major domo. Twi'leks were too cowardly to act upon anything they heard. The man's a scoundrel. Of course, that's nothing I hold against him. He's just not our scoundrel. He's still looking out for himself, and why shouldn't he? But in the meantime, I'm not fooled by all his talk of some grand alliance between himself and the Bounty Hunter's Guild. And if he was taken in by all the rhapsodizing about brotherhood between us, then I really am disappointed in the great Boba Fett. He reached down and scratched between the exposed claws of his feet. That's why I sent my son Bosk in there to talk with him. Bosk may be a bit of a hothead. That's another way he resembles me when I was that age. But he's smart enough to follow through on a good, underhanded plan. You sent him to talk with Boba Fett? Why not? Kradosk felt content with the universe and how things were proceeding in his corner of it. I told Bosk what to say as well. Probably no more than what Boba Fett was expecting from the impatient young heir to leadership of the guild. A partnership between the two of them and against me. The Twi'lek gaped at him. Against you? Of course. If I hadn't set Bosk in there to talk with Fett and have him propose exactly that, then my son would be very likely to have done it on his own initiative. Not because Bosk really wants to conspire against me. He's too loyal and too smart for that. Plus, he knows I'd have his internal organs for breakfast if he tried anything like that. Krados gave a self-satisfied nod of his head. It's much better this way. Now we have an inn with our mysterious visitor and a would-be brother, one to whom Boba Fett will confide the true reasons why he's come here to the guild. My son gains points not only with his loving father, but also with some of the council members who have voiced some fear about his ambitions. And I remain in control of the situation. That's the most important thing. A puzzled look remained on the Twi'lek's face as he rolled up the leather footstraps and placed them in his employer's ornamentations box. Could it not be, the Twi'lek's head tails glistened with the effort of his musing, that your son has a different idea? Different than the one you put into his head? Kradosk folded his claws over the age-yellowed scales of his stomach. Such as... 
Perhaps Bosk doesn't want to just pretend that he has entered into a conspiracy with Boba Fett. A conspiracy against you and the rest of the Guild Council. The Twi'lek rubbed his chin, gazing at some point beyond the sitting room's caparisoned walls, where his infrequently encountered thoughts could be found. Maybe he would have gone and talked to Boba Fett anyway, whether you had sent him or not, and he would have made just that proposition for real. Now there's an interesting notion. Krodosk sat up, bringing his heavy, lidded, and unamused gaze straight into that of his household majordomo. And one for which I should pull your flopping little head off. Do you realize what you're suggesting? The Twi'lek's smile was even more nervous than before. Oh, now that I think of it, you should have done your thinking before you opened your mouth. Anger simmered inside Krados. The only reason he didn't pull off the Twi'lek's head was that a good major domo, one that was used to his various ways and preferences, was hard to find. You're questioning not only my son's intelligence, but his loyalty to me. I realize that members of your species have only an abstract understanding of that concept. But for Trandoshans... Krados thumped his bare chest with his fist. It is something in our blood. Honor and loyalty and the faith that exists between family members. Even unto the last generations, those are not negotiable substances. I beseech your pardon. Hands clasped together, the Twi'lek bobbed up and down in front of Krados. The speed of his genuflections increased by his anxiety. I meant no disrespect. Very well. Krados shooed him away with a quick, contemptuous gesture. Because you're an idiot, I'll overlook your insulting comments. He wouldn't forget them, though. Long, grudge-filled memories were another characteristic of Trandoshans. Now get out of my sight, before I have reason to be hungry again. The Twi'lek scurried away, still hunched over and bowing as he retreated toward the sitting room's door. Maybe I should eat him brooded Krodosk as he drew on a lounging robe stitched together from the skins of former employees. Standards were becoming deplorably lax among the guild's hirelings. Staffing had always been a problem over the decades. In that, the Bounty Hunters Guild had the same difficulties that their clients the Huts did. Not many of the galaxy's sentient creatures were so desperate as to seek employment in establishments where the constant threat of death was one of the working conditions. He wondered if Emperor Palpatine's dismantling of the Republic would improve things in that regard, or just make them worse. The establishment of the Empire promised a net increase in the galaxy's misery quotient. That was good, at least as far as Krados was concerned but also a tighter control over the various world's inhabitants. That was probably bad. Something to think about. Feeling the weight of his age, Krodosk shambled into the memory bone chamber connected to the sitting room. He lit one of the candles set in a niche filled with years of congealed wax. The guttering flame sent interlaced shadows wavering across the walls and their white treasures. It had been a long time since he'd had occasion to add another memento to his collection. My killing days are over, thought Krodosk, not without regret. He wandered farther into the chamber's ivory-lined recesses, letting memories of vanquished opponents and foolishly recalcitrant captives wash over him, until he came to the oldest and tiniest bones. They looked like something that might have been found in a bird's nest, on some planet where all the life forms had been extinct for centuries. Krodosk let a couple of them rest in his palm as he poked at them with a single claw. Tooth marks showed on the bone's surfaces from little teeth that had been as sharp and hard as a newborn's. Teeth that hadn't yet been dulled by the coarse flesh of enemies. Those teeth had been his 
when he'd just barely been out of his mother's egg sack. The bones were those of his spawn brothers, hatched just a few seconds later, and too late for them. Krados sighed, mulling over the wisdom he'd been created with, and that which had taken him so long to achieve. He carefully set his brother's bones back in the hollow of polished rock where he kept them. This was why lesser entities like that moronic Twi'lek would never understand about family loyalty and honor. He pitied creatures like that. They simply had no sense of tradition. The Twi'lek pushed the door to the sitting room open a crack, just enough to see what the old Trandoshan was up to. Krados had gone into his chamber of grisly souvenirs. A candle flame showed his silhouette among the stacked and interwoven bones. Good, thought the Twi'lek. His boss would usually stay in there for hours, fondling the bones and reminiscing, and sometimes falling asleep, wheezing and dreaming with a splintered femur in his claws. Plenty of time, then. The Twi'lek slid the door shut without making a sound and strode quickly toward another section of the Bounty Hunter's Guild compound, to Bosk's quarters. Excellent, said the younger Trandoshan after listening to the Twi'lek's report. You're sure of all this? But of course. The Twi'lek made no attempt to conceal the wickedness of his smile. I have been in your father's service for some time, longer than any of his previous major domos. I haven't lasted this long by being blind to his thought processes. I could decipher the old fool like a data readout, and I could tell you this for a fact. He trusts you absolutely. As he told me, that was why he sent you to talk to Boba Fett. Sitting in a gold-hinged campaign chair, Bosk nodded in approval. I suppose my father had all sorts of things to say. About loyalty and honor and all the rest of that nerf dung. The usual. That must be the hardest part of your job, said Bosk. Listening to fools talk. You have no idea, thought the Twi'lek. I've gotten used to it, he said aloud. Bosk gave another, slower nod. The time is coming when you don't have to listen to that particular fool any longer. When I'm running the Bounty Hunter's Guild, things will be different. I certainly expect so. More of the same, the Twi'lek told himself. He was careful to keep his thoughts from showing on his face. In the meantime... In the meantime, there will be a nice little transfer of credits to your private account. For all your services. Bosk dismissed him with a simple gesture of his upraised claw. You can go now. That fool is right about one thing. The Twi'lek felt a warm glow of satisfaction as he headed back to his own quarters. He was doing a good job. For himself. Boba Fett heard the door creak open. He had to work against his own ingrained habits, which had kept him alive in a hard universe, to keep his back turned toward a door. More bounty hunters had lost their lives from a blaster burning into their spines than had ever taken an opponent's shot face to face. Fett should know. He had taken out more than his share just that way. Excuse me? A cautious voice sounded from the doorway. That was why he'd kept his back toward it, so as to give anyone who came around to his dank chamber to talk to him a perceived psychological advantage. Some of the members of the Bounty Hunters Guild were a little short in the courage department. He found it hard to imagine why they might have thought they would have an aptitude for this business. If they had found themselves looking straight into the dark, narrow visor of his helmet, they might have fled before even opening their mouths. Yes. Boba Fett turned around slowly, as non-threateningly as possible for someone with his reputation. What is it? I was wondering. The short bounty hunter, with large insectoid eyes and breathing hoses, stood in the doorway, 
If I might have a word with you. What was this one's name? They all looked alike to Boba Fett. Zuckus, he remembered, the partner of Bosk, at least as recently as that business where he had snatched the accountant. Nil Possendum, out from under their noses. Uh, of course, uh, if you're busy. Zuckus clasped his gloved hands together in an obvious show of nervousness. I can come back some other time. Not at all. Boba Fett had also seen this one at the guild's banquet hall, close to the reptilian Bosk. So there was undoubtedly still some connection between the two of them. No time like the present, said Fett, for talking about important things. This one didn't take long. Zuckus was hardly in Fett's quarters for more than a few minutes before he had scuttled back out into the corridor, disappearing before anyone from the guild could spot him there. Small fry, thought Boba Fett. Not one of the major players in the Bounty Hunters Guild that Kadama Bat had briefed him on, but important enough with a line straight to the ear of Bosk, who, as the impatient heir apparent to the guild leadership, would have a great deal to do with it being torn apart. The conversation went exactly as Boba Fett had expected, and just as Kadama Bat would have predicted. Zuckus was like so many others in the Bounty Hunters Guild, down in the lower ranks. A perfect combination of greed and naivete. Just smart enough to kill, mused Fett, after Zuckus had left. The short bounty hunter had glanced nervously out of the doorway to make sure no one was there to see him as he scurried down the torchlit corridor. Not smart enough to keep himself from getting killed. It might not happen this time. Zuckus might, with the erratic luck of the feckless, survive the breakup of the guild, but it would eventually. He supposed that was the big difference between himself and poor Zuckus. Between himself and Bosk, and Bosk's vicious, aging father, and all the rest of the guild members. Boba Fett sat down on the stone bench for a moment. The armaments he carried with him, that were as much a part of him as his spine, prevented him from leaning back. He never wasted time thinking about himself. Any more than an explosively lethal missile from the rocket launcher strapped to his back would have as it sped toward its doomed and pinpointed target. But he knew that the reason he was alive, and that others were dead, or soon would be, was that he possessed the true and essential secret of being a bounty hunter. As good as he was at catching, and if need be, killing other sentient creatures, he was even better at surviving their attempts to kill him. Everything else was just a matter of superior firepower. Boba Fett stood up from the stone bench. If he stayed here any longer, there would be others coming to talk to him. Others who thought they could protect themselves the way he did, but who were already fatally enmeshed in the trap spun by Kadama Bat, so far away that he couldn't be seen, or the tugs on the strands of his web even felt. Besides Bosk and Zuckus, there had also been one of Kradosk's top advisors on the Guild Council, and the Twi'lek Major Domo, back for a longer talk when he'd brought Fett to his dank chamber. All of them had been in pure deal-cutting mode, eager to help pull the Bounty Hunters Guild apart so they would get a bigger piece of whatever was left in the wreckage. Right now, he didn't feel like talking to anyone else. Action meant more than words, that was one other thing Boba Fett was sure of. A man was killed by words and saved by action. Spending so much time talking to other sentient creatures had been like wrapping himself in death. What he wanted to do right now was head back to the Slave One, his refuge docked at the edge of the guild's main compound, lock himself behind its overlapping security layers, all systems primed to fry anyone who tried to breach them, and rest. If not the sleep of the virtuous, Fett had no illusions about that, or regrets, then at least the sleep of someone who had put in a good day's work. In his business, that meant helping others arrange their own destruction. The presence of those other sentient creatures, carrying their fates around with them, all unaware, laid a cold hand on Boba Fett's heart, or whatever passed for it after all these years of death. It felt like some prophecy of his own death, though he was just as sure that that was a long way off, far from here in both time and space. 
Being back inside his own ship would be as much a relief as being out in the emptiness between the stars. He would be alone there, sealed off from all the others, living and dead. That was what he needed. He pushed the rough wooden door shut behind himself and strode down the corridor, beneath the flickering light of the torches. Anywhere but here, thought Boba Fett. The tunnel stretched out before him. Above him, the invisible weight of rock and stone pressed down, like the tomb he hadn't earned yet. And that is the end of chapter 11. So that was, um, again, a, a relatively long chapter, much more about the interpersonal relationships, conversations, and politics of this story. So we're really setting up quite a web of intrigue here, with Kradosk thinking that he's playing Bosk, with Bosk thinking he's playing Kradosk, with uh, the Twi'lek Ob Fortuna, uh, Bib Fortuna's cousin, brother? I wasn't sure. I thought it was his cousin. Um, but he is also trying to play everyone else a gut... Uh, everyone off against each other, I believe is what I meant to say. And then Boba Fett, somewhere in the middle of it all, trying to come out on top, or, as he mentioned, at least trying not to die. It's going to be very interesting. It's quite dark at the moment. It feels like there's uh, a lot to deal with, and I do... I am genuinely concerned about Boba Fett, because he doesn't realise that, of course, Prince Zizor is behind all this, and, behind him, the Emperor. So it's pretty... It looks like there could be some pretty bad implications for our boy Boba. Even worse than being stuck in a Sarlacc pit? I'm not sure. But now we're going to move on to chapter 12, which brings us back to the present day. So that's after the events of Return of the Jedi, and when uh, Boba has been discovered by Dengar and is being healed by droids. Chapter 12. Now. You were saying things. Dengar handed the figure on the pallet a metal cup filled with water. In your sleep. Sleep was the wrong word, he knew. Dying would have been more accurate. Except that Boba Fett hadn't died after all. After everything. Is that so? Even unhelmeted, Boba Fett had a gaze that was as cold and exterminating as anything that had looked out from the black, narrow visor. Lying on the improvised bed in the hiding place's smallest subchamber, Fett's lethal potential appeared undiminished, as though his ravaged flesh were only a temporary costume, less real than the ragged battle gear stacked up in the corner. What did I say? Nothing important, replied Dengar. He knew better than to have told the truth. If Fett's drugged up, unconscious mutterings had amounted to anything. This Barv lives by secrets, thought Dengar. To get inside any of those secrets would be like stealing something from him. And the consequences of that, Dengar was well aware, would not be pretty. Something about uh, not liking so many sentient creatures around you. Stuff like that. Ah. Boba Fett raised his head and managed to sip the water he'd been given. His smile looked like a blade wound in the abraded skin of his face. And I still don't like it. Please do not agitate the patient. The taller of the two medical droids scolded Dengar. The droid and its shorter partner were busy changing the dressings around Boba Fett's torso. Bloodied rags and sterile gel sheets were peeled away from the raw flesh beneath. Wounds such as Fett's took a long time to heal. The Sarlacc's gastric secretions were like acid creeping toward the bone, long after the beast itself was dead. If I had the authority to do so, continued Shelby, I would order you out of this area immediately. But you don't. Dengar leaned back against the subchamber's crumbling rock wall. The air inside the hiding place was as hot and desiccating as the interior of one of the ancient burial mounds that studded the farther reaches of the Dune Sea, where Tatooine's double suns turned corpses into withered leather. Besides, said Dengar, if you two hadn't killed him by now, nothing will. Sarcasm, Lexi spoke as it readied another combination of opiates and antiseptics. Non-appreciation. There's someone else in this place, isn't there? Boba Fett had drawn his head back from the metal cup that Dengar had held out to him. 
The mere effort of his words sent his chest labouring, the dials and readouts on the surrounding equipment blipping into the red. A female. Dengar said nothing. He placed the half-empty cup on top of one of the sighing machines that the two medical droids tended. He had other things to take care of. Other things to do besides talk with the sinister figure lying on the pallet. A little farther away from death's shores than Fett had been even a couple of days ago. One of the hiding place's lower generators had conked out, spewing white sparks and a dense cloud of greasy smoke. That had necessitated shutting down all the minimum air recyclers, resulting in the hot, thick miasma bound inside the hiding place. Dengar could more profitably take care of the generator, getting it back up and back online, rather than staying here at Boba Fett's bedside. But the other man's cold gaze held him as tight as the curved hook of a gaff stick. There's no need to lie to me about it, said Boba Fett. His words were as cold and unemotional as the gaze from his eyes. I saw her. She came in here. Yesterday, I suppose. It's still hard for me to tell about all these things. But it was dark, and she must have thought I was asleep. Or that I died, perhaps. Please, said Shelby. It fussed with the tubes running between the machines and Boba Fett's body. You're making our job considerably more difficult. Dengar ignored the medical droid. He was about to answer Fett, to tell the bounty hunter who the female was, when the bombs hit. Real bombs. Dust sifted from the subchamber's ceiling, speckling the lenses of Shelby's head unit, swiveling up toward the sound of thunder. Windstorms infrequently lashed the dune sea, floods of sand churning down the stone gullies and vanishing just as quickly beneath the twin suns. Dengar had always thought that the hiding place he'd dug for himself was too far beneath the planet's surface to take any damage from mere weather. It'll take something stronger, he decided, to get in here. His own words were still looping around inside his head when the rocks fell, with even louder thunder from above onto his face. He looked up, along with the two medical droids. He had a memory flash of a light sharp as blades against his eyes and brighter than Tatooine's suns combined into one. Then he was spitting out gravel and blood as he felt his arm being tugged by someone unseen. Come on! The voice was Neela's, her hands gripped tight around his forearm and pulled. Rocks and sand poured off his chest as his scrabbling efforts, feeble at first and then made stronger by sudden desperation combined with hers to extract him from the remains of the subchamber. He's still in there! She meant Boba Fett, of course. The hiding place's emergency lights flickered as the remaining generator came to life. Dengar could still hear thunder receding into the distance, up on the surface level. The thunder would return, he knew. He was familiar enough with saturation bombing techniques to be aware that that was what was going on up there. One wave would be succeeded by another, crossing the ground at a right angle from the first sweep. There wouldn't be any stones left, no gullies or eroded pillars. Everything would be hammered into dust. And as for whatever might lie beneath the surface... Neela was already digging at the rubble that blocked the doorway to the subchamber. Enough of the dust had settled that Dengar could see how the bomb's impact had knocked him back toward the hiding place's main area. If he had been any farther inside, where the medical droids had been taking care of their patient... The rockfall would have come straight down on him, crushing his skull. Confusion! Neela's bleeding fingers had already excavated the smaller of the droids, with its carapace dented, torso readouts cracked and blinking. Lexi crawled away from the rocks and righted itself with difficulty. Noise! Not goodness! What are you waiting for? Neela looked back around at him, her eyes blazing through the dust and sweat covering her face. Help me! Are you crazy? Dengar reached down and grabbed an arm, pulling Neela to her feet. There isn't time for that. Whoever's laying down those bombs on the surface will be back in less than a minute. We've got to get out of here. I'm not going without him. Neela yanked her arm for Dengar's grasp. Save yourself if you want to. She turned away and started tugging at one of the larger rocks, nearly as high as herself. There were tunnels underneath the hiding place, curving and smooth-sided that ran deep into the planet's bedrock. 
Dengar had investigated them far enough to know that they connected with the Great Pit of Carcoon. With the Sarlacc beast dead now, they would make a safe refuge from the bombing. But only if they were reached in time before the next destructive wave collapsed what had remained of these spaces. He hesitated only a moment before cursing himself as a fool and laying both his hands on the rock just above Neela's hands. The stone surface was already slick with her blood. Dengar dug his own fingertips into it and pulled, straining with his weight against the rock's resistance. From far off and above, he could hear the bombing of the surface come to a halt, like a storm that has spent its thunderous fury. That's only temporary, he knew. They'd be returning in this direction soon enough. Dengar put his shoulder against the rock, his hands clawing for a better grip. It struck him, between one gasp for breath and the next, that he didn't even know who it could be that was pounding the dune sea above his head into scorched powder. Forces of the Empire, maybe? Or the Rebel Alliance? Or the Huts? Or the Black Sun Organization? At this point, it wasn't as important as just surviving the hard, murderous rain. The only thing he knew for certain, down in his gut, was that it had something to do with Boba Fett. Getting involved with this barve was a sure ticket to disaster. The large rock suddenly shifted, spilling Neela forward onto the main chamber's rubble-strewn floor. Dengar managed to keep his balance, shifting his hold and thrusting with his bent legs, keeping the stone rolling. Neela scrambled out of its way as the debris of the sub-chamber's shattered doorway came tumbling after it. You are wasting time, announced Shelby from within the suddenly revealed space beyond the rocks and settling dust. The medical droid had busied itself by disconnecting the various tubes and monitoring wires that had been hooked up to Boba Fett. Therapeutic protocols render it imperative that the patient be removed from these unsafe premises at once. Lying on the pallet, Boba Fett had lapsed back into unconsciousness, either from the crashing impact of the bombing raid or from an anaesthetic dose administered by the medical droid. Dengar and Neela scrambled over the rocks. Each took one end of the pallet and lifted, hoisting Fett high enough to carry out into the hiding place's main chamber. Wait a second. After they were clear, Neela set down her end of the pallet and climbed back into what remained of the subchamber space. Cracks spidered across its ceiling, showering down more dust and loose stones as the sharp, percussive hammer strokes from above grew louder. Neela emerged a second later with Boba Fett's scoured and dented helmet and combat gear. She piled it up on top of the unconscious bounty hunter, then grabbed hold of the pallet again. Okay, let's go! They both collapsed in exhaustion when they had reached the safety of the lower Sarlacc dug tunnels. The two medical droids fretted over their patient as Dengar and Neela sprawled back against the fused smooth walls curving around them. From here, the bombing raid sounded as though it were happening on some other unluckier world. What's that smell? Neela wrinkled her nose as she turned her gaze toward the darkness and the stench of the tunnel's lower reaches. Dengar shifted the lantern he had managed to scavenge hastily from the hiding place's equipment. Its feeble glow extended a few meters into the dark before being swallowed up. Probably the Sarlacc, he said, or what's left of it. The part that could be seen in the great pit of Carcoon was just its head and mouth. It had tentacles extending all through the rock. Some say as far as the edges of the Dune Sea. When our friend here blew out the Sarlacc's gut, Dengar pointed with his thumb to Boba Fett on the pallet. There was a lot of dead beast left rotting down here. You can't expect something like that to smell too good, you know. The stench of decay grew worse, as though the vibration of the surface bombing had shaken open a buried pustule. Neela's face paled, then she quickly scrambled to her knees and hurried to a farther bend of the tunnel. The sounds of gagging and retching travelled back to Dengar. She's not used to this sort of thing, mused Dengar. Or some part of her wasn't. Something held in the darkness and hidden memory inside her. That intrigued him. A mere dancing girl, a pretty servant in the court of Jabba the Hutt, would have gotten accustomed to the smell of death quickly enough. 
It had pervaded the walls of Jabba's palace, seeping up from the rancor pit beneath the throne room. Huts, in general, liked that smell. It was one of their more loathsome characteristics of their species to revel in a constant olfactory reminder that they were alive and their enemies and the objects of their lethal amusements were dead and rotting beneath them. That, among other things, was why Dengar had considered employment with the late Jabba or any of the other members of his clan as a choice of last resort, especially so after Dengar had found Manaru and his love for her. How could one return to that being who represented one's essence, an almost forgotten purity and grace, with the stink of dead, defeated flesh wrapped around oneself? It was impossible. It seemed impossible for this Neela to endure as well. She had the temperament of one born to the galaxy's nobility, a bloodline accustomed to command and the obedience of others. Dengar had noted that just from the way she had faced him down in their first encounter. Anyone else who had gone through the unsavory rigors of Jabba's court, followed by unprotected exposure to the Dune Sea, would have quailed before the obvious superiority of Dengar's strength and weaponry. But some spark of courage inside Neela had burned even brighter under those conditions, fierce enough to have burned his outstretched hand if he had dared to touch her. That aristocratic strain was apparent in the female's face as well. Even darkened and toughened as it was by the lash of the double suns and the scouring of the dune sea's hot, razor-like winds. She'll be trouble. Dengar already knew. He'd had enough on his hands before she had come along, but with her presence added to the equation, the result was increased exponentially. Neela returned, face even paler in the glow from the single lantern. I'm sorry, she said. Don't be. Dengar gave a shrug. I'll be the first to admit that this isn't the most pleasant neighborhood. He got to his feet. We might as well see what kind of shape we're in. The two medical droids were stationed on either sides of Boba Fett's pallet. How's the patient? Shelby glanced back at Dengar. As well as can be expected, the droid said irritably. Given the disturbance he's been put through. Hey. Dengar poked himself in the chest. Did I order a bombing raid to start up? Don't blame everything on me. That's not a bad question. Standing beside him, Neela glanced over the unconscious form of the bounty hunter. Who did order it? Who knows? Dengar set the lamp on a shoulder-high outcropping. This guy's got major enemies. It was probably one of them. Then that would mean somebody knows he's alive. Somebody besides us. That realization snapped together in Dengar's brain, like a pair of wires that had become disconnected during the tumult. She's right. Somehow, the word must have gotten out, to somebody for whom it was an important piece of information that Boba Fett hadn't died. That breath, however shallow, was still going in and out of his body. Someone wasn't happy about that. Someone who would send out sufficient explosive force to pulverize an army just to make sure that there wouldn't be enough left of Boba Fett to take a breath. Somebody was spying on us, said Dengar. He had already eliminated himself as the source of the leak and he had sworn Manaru to secrecy. Neela wasn't a likely suspect. There had been no place for her to go, no one for her to talk to while she'd been out in the Dune Sea and she hadn't left the hiding place since Dengar had taken her in. Maybe somebody from Jabba's palace, he thought. There had been plenty of scoundrels there, even after Jabba's death, with the necessary skills for staying unseen while watching the comings and goings out in the wastelands. Especially after losing a lucrative gig with the hut, any one of them would be motivated to sell valuable info to the highest bidder to some agent of the Empire, or anyone else who had a big enough grudge against Boba Fett. That must have been what happened. Dengar nodded slowly. Somebody saw me taking Fett down into my hiding place. Don't be stupid. Neela shook her head. If somebody knew exactly where Fett had been taken, they wouldn't have bothered blowing up everything within sight of the Great Pit of Carcoon. One missile straight down the tunnel entrance would have done the job, simple and clean. She pointed toward the silent form on the pallet. 
If that's all it took to kill him off, they would have done it the easy way and the quiet way. She had a point. Dengar admitted to himself, Boba Fett wasn't the only one who lived by secrets. The kind of clients he'd had and enemies he'd made were the same way. A surgical strike would have eliminated Fett without the risk of drawing attention that a bombing raid entailed. Dengar had heard nothing the last time he'd been talking to his own information sources in Moss Eisley about a contract being put out on Boba Fett. So, if anybody was actively gunning for him, they were definitely keeping it quiet. Unless, said Dengar, there's some other reason for the raid. Neela gave him a withering look. Do you think there's some other reason? He didn't bother to answer. Silence filled the tunnel as he looked upward, listening and waiting. I think we're all clear now. We can go back up? Are you kidding? Dengar shook his head, then picked up the lantern and directed its light toward the tunnel they had come down. The light picked up the jumbled shapes of the rubble filling the passageway. We're blocked off. Even if there's anything left of my hiding place, which is a big if given the pounding that was going on up there, we couldn't get to it now. We'll have to push on and see if there's some other way of getting out to the surface. A shiver of disgust ran across Neela's shoulders. The smell of rot was noticeably stronger toward the tunnel's unlit end. Can he travel? Dengar pointed toward Boba Fett. It would be better, said Shelby, from a therapeutic standpoint if he were left undisturbed. That's not what I asked. I don't know why you bothered to inquire at all. Shelby's tone was distinctly haughty. I imagine you'll do whatever you're planning on, no matter what one EXE and I tell you. Come on. Dengar motioned Neela over toward the pallet. These droids don't know how tough this bar really is. They managed to lift the pallet, with Dengar taking most of the unconscious figure's weight onto his arms, until the loose gravel shifted under his feet, and he saw how strong Neela actually was. She braced herself and caught the load from toppling to one side. Dengar instructed one of the medical droids to loop the carrying strap of the pallet around his neck. With the lantern's beam wavering ahead of them, they started downward into the murk and stomach-churning smell. How do you know... At the pallet's back end, Neela gasped for breath. How do you know we can get out this way? I don't, said Dengar simply. But there's an air current coming in from somewhere. You can feel it on your face. He glanced over his shoulder at her. The nauseated pallor had diminished slightly. She had gone numb to the smell of the decaying Sarlax carcass buried beneath whatever was left of its nest under the great pit of Carcoon. Neela took a deep breath, nostrils flared, and only gagged slightly. Even with the stink, continued Dengar, I could tell it's coming from somewhere outside of these tunnels. If we follow it to its source, we might find some place we can either crawl out or dig our way out to the surface. Or... He gave a shrug. We won't. The bombing raid might have collapsed the rest of the tunnels with too much rubble for us to get through. In which case, it's pretty much over for all of us. You sound pretty calm about that possibility. What's my choices? I volunteered for this gig. One corner of Dengar's mouth lifted in a grim smile. Later on, when I'm actually dying... I might let myself get a little more emotional about it. In the meantime, we might as well save our strength for whatever digging we're going to have to do. He lifted his end of the pallet higher. Come on, we might as well find out what it's going to be. The two medical droids followed behind. This goes against all sound therapeutic protocols. Shelby voiced its concern again. We're not taking responsibility for whatever happens to our patient. Absolution! The shorter one trundled with difficulty over the tunnel's rough terrain. Lack of blame. Yeah, right, whatever. Dengar didn't look back at the complaining droids. You're off the hook. The lantern's beam faded away into the darkness ahead of him. Just don't tell me about it. Do you think he'll be okay? The worry in Neela's voice was audible. He's been jostled around quite a bit. Maybe we should let the droids take a look at him. That's a good idea. 
Dengar kept on walking down the tunnel's slope, his hands gripping the corner of the pallet at his back. That'll give whoever it is topside lots of time to take another pass at us. Oh, Neela sounded abashed. I guess you're right. About this one I am. We'll all be better off the sooner we get out of here. He was already thinking about the next time he would see Manaru, and if he would ever see her again. A lot of his recent decisions, his plans and schemes, were swiftly metamorphosing into regrets. And this could be the last one, he thought as the pallet's weight, combined with that of its unconscious passenger, caused it to dig into Dengar's hands. Even his sensory perceptions, the tantalizing hint of fresh air against his sweating face, could have been lies and wishes, rather than a simple truth that he was walking through his own tomb. His doubts faded a bit when the tunnel's floor leveled beneath his feet. The slope he and Neela had carried Boba Fett down had extended through its various twists and turns at least a hundred yards. That wasn't enough, Dengar knew, to take them out of the territory of another bombing raid. But he was familiar with the rocky outcroppings of the dune sea's surface all around what had been his hiding place's entrance. There was a good chance that he had reached a point where the ground's bones hadn't been completely atomized. The bomb's impact might even have created new passages to the oxygen above, untainted by the stench of the rotting sarlacc. By now, the smell had gotten bad enough that Dengar could taste it, a nauseating film that had crept down the back of his tongue. Look! Neela called out from behind him. Dengar glanced over his shoulder, then in the direction in which her up's raised hand pointed, as she balanced the corner of the pallet against her thigh. The lantern's beam swept across a slanting heap of broken stone. I don't see anything. Turn off the lantern, ordered Neela. He thumbed off the power switch. The light had been dim enough that his eyes only took a few seconds to adjust to the darkness, which wasn't complete. A thread of daylight, clouded with dust motes, drew a jag-edged spot, only a few inches from the toes of his boots. Dengar tilted his head back and spotted the cleft in the rocks overhead. The hole looked hardly bigger than the width of his hand. This'll take a little work, Dengar mulled over the situation. He and Neela had lowered the pallet between themselves. With the lantern switched back on, he studied the wall of the crumbled stone nearest the hole. I can get up there all right, and so can you. It doesn't look like that bad a climb. He pointed to Fett. He's going to be the problem, though. You've got a line coil, don't you? With a nod of her head, Neela indicated one of the equipment pouches at Dengar's waist. If you could get up there and pry open the gap wider, or you could get out to the surface, and then I could tie a loop around his chest and under his arms, and you could haul him up. Nothing had been heard from the medical droids for a while as they had straggled along behind Dengar and Neela. But now, Shelby spoke up. The patient, it protested loudly, is not in any kind of condition for a maneuver as you've described. Very simply, you'll kill him if you try that. Yeah, and if we leave him down here, he'll be just as dead. Under the best of circumstances, Dengar would have gotten tired of the droid's officious carping. He took out the line and fastened one end to his belt so his hands would be free for climbing. He gave the rest of the coil to Neela and then nodded toward Boba Fett. Pull him back a bit so both of you will be out of the way of whatever I pull down. There was another possibility that Dengar had left unspoken. Specifically that, in trying to widen the light spilling gap overhead, he'd bring down the entire roof of this underground space, burying himself and the others under a few tons of rock. The bombing raid had left the area in a state of fragile balance. Even removing the smallest stone might trigger a collapse of everything surrounding it. He left the lantern with Neela, instructing her to point it toward the area around the bright crevice he'd be working on. As he started to climb, fingertips digging into the loose rock, he could hear her dragging the pallet over to the farthest angle of the space below him. One stone shifted as he put his hand's weight on it. The stone came free and tumbled away. He would have followed it, crashing down hard on the slope he'd traversed so far if he hadn't managed to loop one arm around a larger outcropping just above and to the side of his head. His feet dangled in the air for a moment as more of the dislodged stones rattled and slid out from under his boot soles. 
Are you all right? Dengar heard Neela's voice from below as the lantern beam pinned his one hand, straining to hold its grip on the outcropping, and his other dug in next to it. Do I look all right? The hazard annoyed Dengar more than alarmed him. Without turning his head, he shouted down to Neela, Move the light! Over just a bit! The beam shifted as he managed to get more of his weight balanced on the outcropping, his chest pressing against his top ridge. He reached up and grasped the edge of the tiny gap he had spotted from the floor of the tunnel. With a push, it gave way. He flung the stone away as he turned his head to shield his eyes from the gravel and dust raining down. More daylight spilled down from the dune sea's surface. Dengar could even see, as he tilted his head back, a patch of cloudless sky. We can make it, he thought with relief. Sweat trickled down his neck and across his chest as his free hand yanked out a few more stones jutting into the vertical opening. They fell into darkness, striking the others he had previously torn loose. He was grateful for the fresh air, dry and hot as it was from the sun's pounding temperature, that flooded across his face and into his throat. Anything was better than the stink that filled the caverns and tunnels beneath the surface. The beam of light suddenly disappeared. Hey! Dengar shouted to Neela below him. Swing that light back up here! The glare of daylight coming down the widened hole wasn't enough for him to make out the details of the space's ceiling. He couldn't see which rock to grab and pull on next. I still need it! There's something down here! Neela's shout echoed off the curved walls of crumbling stone. Her next words were tinged with sudden fear. Something big! And that's the end of chapter 12. Quite a dramatic end, and I'm hoping that chapter 13 will just carry on, because I want to see what this something is. But, um, I, well, I just looked at it, and the first word is Dengar, so yes, I think the next chapter just picks us straight up, so that's good. Okay, this chapter. I quite liked it. Um, real fun, just piece of, uh, action and adventure. Really enjoy that. I love that they're going under the uh, Sarlacc pit. We talked a little bit on um, the last episode of the Fulcrum Report that we did with Amanda from Galaxy of Queers. Really wonderful to have her. And they mentioned uh, Amanda and Gilbs were talking about these diagrams of what a Sarlacc actually looks like underneath the sand. And this is going into that, all the tunnels that it has to create to fit. Now, do we know if other things live within those tunnels? Is this thing that's about to jump out, is that part of the Sarlacc? Is it something that's still alive, a baby? Or is it some sort of thing that coexists with the Sarlacc living in these tunnels with it? Perhaps it is perhaps some kind of uh, Tatooinean biology of uh, creatures that, like hermit crabs, will invade the tunnels where a Sarlacc used to live to create their own defense. That I'd find very interesting. And it might be revealed in the next chapter, but hey, Place your bets in the comments below and let me know what you think it's going to be before we find out right now. Chapter 13 Dengar managed to twist himself around so he could see what she was talking about. A raw laugh burst from his throat as he recognized the mottled surface, rounded and stretching higher than even the tallest humanoid stature. It's the Sarlacc, said Dengar. Or part of it at least. From his precarious hold on the rock outcropping, he watched as Neela played the light across the immense serpentine form, its bulk sealing off the far end of the cavern. There was no sign of the creature's head or tail, as the segment made visible by the lantern lay immobile. That's why it smells so bad in here, remember? There's probably pieces of it scattered all through these tunnels, or whatever's left of them. Nose wrinkling in disgust, Neela stepped a little closer to the giant form. Enough light bounced off its scales, made shinier by patches of decay and the dried ichor of its blood, that the pallet with Boba Fett on it could be seen several meters away. The two medical droids, the readouts on their torsos blinking, regarded Neela's investigations with only mild curiosity. Dengar turned back to his work on their escape route. Get that light beam up here! It's alive! The force of Neela's shout came close to knocking Dengar loose from the outcropping. What are you talking about? 
He pulled himself farther up the stone before looking back down. You could smell that the thing's deader than... It moved! With her voice a mixture of fury and alarm, Neela pointed at the bulk of the Sarlacc segment. I saw it just now when I poked at it. Nothing to worry about, said Dengar. His arm, where it crossed over the stone's corner ridge, was starting to go numb. Probably just part of the decomposition process. You must have disturbed some gas bubble inside tissues. It's probably going to get a lot worse smelling in here real soon. His words turned to silence as a visible shiver ran across the towering convex wall of the Sarlacc segment. Dengar could easily see the motion, like a peristaltic wave traveling across the scales and crusted decay patches. There! Neela kept the lantern beam directed at the glistening bulk. That's what it did before. I thought you said this thing was dead. It better be, thought Dengar. A sense of foreboding moved up from the base of his stomach and into his throat. Boba Fett had killed the damn thing. He'd blown his way out of its gut. From trauma like that, the Sarlacc had to have died. There was no other possibility. None. The word looped inside Dengar's head with a touch of panic. That fear rose out of his dark, unbidden wondering. No one had ever seen the Sarlacc entire. It had lain buried in its nest in the great pit of Carcoon before there had even been sentient beings on the planet of Tatooine. The Tusken Raiders, who had ridden their shaggy bantha mounts across the Dune Sea wastes for centuries untold, had ancient legends of the Sarlacc giving birth to itself at this world's centre in the days before the twin suns had split apart. Born and growing with the slow persistence of an eternal creature, digging and rooting itself in its tunnels beneath the sand and rocks until one day would come when it had eaten everything else and would consume itself, continuing an endless cycle of destruction and rebirth. It was all nonsense, Dengar knew. There was no point in paying attention to Tuscan myths. But at the same time, nobody on or off Tatooine had ever determined the exact physiology of the Sarlacc. Maybe it's got more than one stomach, thought Dengar. Or it can regenerate itself like a plant. Nice possibilities for it. Too bad for anybody who might have foolishly wandered into its reach. Like us. His fears proved suddenly correct. The curving wall of the Sarlacc segment reared up like a giant serpent uncoiling. It reached higher than Dengar's hold on the outcropping, the scales dragging across the roof of the cavern several meters away from him. A shower of rocks and sharp-edged debris rained down as Neela scrambled to temporary safety near the pallet and the two medical droids. The interior of the cavern shook with seismic force as the Sarlacc's writhing form crashed down again. Dengar gripped the outcropping tighter, trying to keep from being thrown loose from it. More rubble poured down the widened gap, with hot stones and sand falling across his shoulders and the side of his averted face. Even before he could see what was happening down below, Dengar had gotten his end of the rope line around the outcropping and had knotted it fast. Grab the line! he shouted as the dust started to settle. I'll pull you up! He could feel her tugging at the other end of the line, but when he could see below himself again, the space dimly illuminated by a combination of the daylight from above and the beam of the lantern knocked on its side, he saw that Neela had dragged the unconscious figure of Boba Fett from the pallet and had gotten him upright. Fett's weight was braced against her shoulder as she looped the line around his chest. There! Neela stepped back and shouted to Dengar. Take him up! Start pulling! Boba Fett's arms dangled at his side, the tauten rope all that kept his limp body from collapsing to the floor of the cavern. His head lolled forward, chin against his chest. The only sign of him still being alive was the slight motion of his ragged breath. No point in arguing. Dengar knew that it would be a waste of time with the obstinate female. He clambered up onto the outcropping's top surface, then reached down and grabbed the line with both hands. His spine hit the rock wall behind him as he reared back and pulled. 
The body of the unconscious bounty hunter straightened, feet dangling clear of the ground, as Dengarth drew Fett toward himself. The cavern shook as the Sarlacc segment, either in its death throes or from hunger, spurred by its awareness of the human's presence, convulsively lifted itself and slammed its length against the side of the cavern directly beneath Dengar. Beneath the pounding of his heart, the outcropping trembled and groaned, as though the larger stone it was part of was about to pull free from the upper reaches of the cavern wall. He reached down and grabbed another section of line, hauling Boba Fett higher into the open space. The Sarlacc segment came within inches of the bounty hunter's feet as it doubled upon itself in hissing agony. Fett was still several meters away from Dengar's grasp as the Sarlacc segment crashed down toward the cavern floor once again. Its head and tail were unseen, extending into the darkness at either end of the space. The echo of its impact against the ground rolled through the cavern like buried thunder. More sharp bits of rock pelted against Dengar's back. One side of the gap, the escape route to the surface he had been widening, sheared off and fell tumbling, inches away from the suspended figure of Boba Fett. The limp bounty hunter slowly revolved as Dengar strained to pull him higher. That was the only motion Fett showed, as though the loop around his chest had squeezed the last remaining life force from him. Past Fett, Dengar could see the two medical droids scurrying to safety at the other side of the cavern as the Sarlacc segment twisted onto its side, scales crushing the rocks beneath it to powder. Neela backed away, the lantern's beam widening against the Sarlacc's flank, then turned and ran as the towering curve gained speed, rolling toward her. As Dengar watched, the stone fragment slid out from beneath her feet, throwing her onto her hands and knees. The lantern clattered to a halt less than a meter away, its beam angling upward onto the bulk of the Sarlacc. The growing ellipse of light on the Sarlacc's scales grew larger as the segment continued to twist about like a hideous tidal wave of rough-edged armor and injured flesh. Neela gave a cry of mingled pain and fear as the segment rolled onto her foot and lower leg, pinning her to the floor of the cavern. The Sarlacc segment halted its motion, as if some sense within it was aware of the captive it had made. Its convex mass loomed over Neela as she twisted onto her side and pushed futilely at it with her bare hands. All that it would take to crush her into a lifeless and broken thing would be for the Sarlacc to continue its twisting, rolling motion, the heavy tide of its bulk sweeping through the cavern and obliterating everything in its path. Dengar tugged the rope line high enough to loop it around the end of the outcropping, leaving the unconscious Boba Fett suspended above the Sarlacc segment. With one hand holding on, he dug with the other into the holster on his belt, caught between his own weight and the rock's surface. He managed to drag out his blaster, leaving a braided skin from the back of his hand across a rough stone. Dengar shifted his position on the outcropping, trying to line up a clear shot, past the dangling figure of Boba Fett and into the mass of the Sarlacc. That shifting weight on the stone, plus the damage to the already precarious walls of the cavern caused by the Sarlacc's convulsive thrashing, was enough to break the outcropping free. A hairline crack just past Dengar's elbow, splitting open with a puff of dust. The forward edge of the outcropping shot downward as he scrambled to keep hold of it. His teeth rattled in his head as the narrow point of stone jammed itself against the other side of the crevice a meter below where the outcropping had been positioned before. The knot of the line fastened to Boba Fett slid down the outcropping and caught at the juncture of the stone and the crevice wall. The sharp, sudden movement had knocked the blaster free from Dengar's grip. Clutching the stone, he watched helplessly, time expanding into slow motion as the weapon spun in the air and choking dust near the cavern's ceiling, then fell. Grip and muzzle tumbled end over end beyond any point where Dengar could have caught it, even if he'd been able to take one of his clawing hands away from the stone. He saw something else then, something that had come to life as unexpectedly as the buried Sarlacc. The sudden drop of the line had snapped Boba Fett's head back so that his pale, unhelmeted visage 
was turned toward Dengar and the daylight spilling into the cavern from above. The bounty hunter appeared dead, as though the medical droid's disregarded warnings had proved true after all. It might as well have been a corpse that Dengar and Neela had carried through the underground tunnels, and that now dangled unmoving in midair. Boba Fett's eyes opened, gazing directly into Dengar's. Slow motion time stopped entirely as Fett's cold regard pierced the other bounty hunter's spirit. Then, time started up again, slamming into microsecond events. One of Boba Fett's hands raised from his side, shot out, and caught the falling blaster as sharply and deftly as an uncoiling serpent striking its prey. The weapon filled his grasp as though it were an extension of his being, a part of him as much as the bones of his spine. Fett's gaze broke away as Dengar watched from above, Boba Fett scanned downwards to where the great bulk of the Sarlacc segment held Neela trapped against the cavern's floor. He extended his arm, the blaster muzzle on the same direct course as his sight, straight into the massive curved flank of the Sarlacc. The cavern filled with blade-edge shadows as the blaster erupted into coruscating fire, its explosive touch pulsing at a diagonal across the open space. Its force was enough to deflect the rope line from the vertical, like a miniature rocket thrusting Boba Fett away from its flaring burst. Fett kept the blaster's impact pouring into the same spot on the curved surface of the Sarlacc as a burning stench mingled with the thick odour of decay that had already hung in the close, long-oppressing air. At the exact same moment, the Sarlacc segment reared upward, stung by the blaster's white, hot needle. Bits of broken scales and charred flesh scattered across the cavern. The creature's raw wound, cut deeper by the continuing fire, sizzled beneath an acrid haze of black smoke. Neela dug her fingertips into the rubble-strewn cavern floor as more sparks and pieces of blackened tissue rained around her, striking a pool of the Sarlacc's blood with quick, spattering steam. She crawled painfully forward, dragging the leg that had been trapped behind her, as the bright stream from the blaster in Boba Fett's grip continued tearing open a wider and deeper section, like a red doorway being carved into living stone. A scream of agony, the wordless cry of a wounded beast, sounded from far within the unlit tunnels, beyond the cavern space, louder and shriller until it was a physical presence, its force shivering the walls and tearing one stone loose from another. Neela crouched against the side of the cavern, close to the two medical droids, as sections of the cavern's ceiling cracked apart and fell. The broken stones struck the bleeding and charred flank of the Sarlacc segment, then tumbled and rolled to a halt, mounting against the creature. The cry broke off as a different motion seized what was left visible of the Sarlacc, the rocks piled against it shifted as the segment retracted into the tunnel opening at the farthest edge of the cavern. From above, Dengar had a momentary glimpse of a ragged terminus, grey and scabbed, with the segment that had been torn from its connection with the larger creature. Then it was gone, leaving the stones and churning dust behind. In Boba Fett's hand, the blaster went silent. He looked back toward the light-filled opening and the outcropping precariously slanted across. Dengar could see in the bounty hunter's face that he was burning up the last of his strength, summoned from a reserve deep within him. Lower me, Fed's voice rasped, like words spoken within an airless tomb. Now! Dengar managed to brace his feet against the side of the gap, enough to unfasten the line from the outcropping and pay it out hand over hand, gradually dropping Boba Fett toward the floor of the cavern. When the line slackened, Dengar looped it over his shoulder, using his other hand to climb up the vertical opening. He reached the surface, collapsing onto the hot sands of the dune sea, drawing in an exhausted breath. He sat up and clutched the line tight in his fists. A tug came on the line. Dengar stood up and pulled, grabbing more of the line as he backed step by step away from the opening. He could tell from the weight that there was more than just Boba Fett at the other end of the line now. More muscle than brain, 
thought Dengar, as he brought the line inch by inch over the rocks and sand. He supposed that was why he had a certain place in the bounty hunter business, and Boba Fett had a different and much more famous one. He dug in, the line's tautness keeping him from falling over backward, and finally saw one of Fett's arms reach upward from the sinkhole, his hand sinking into the ground and leveraging his chest into view. Boba Fett had his other arm around Neela, holding her tight against himself. The hole had been widened just enough between Dengar's efforts and the crashing of the Sarlacc segment to allow the two close-pressed bodies to scrape through. The line went slack, dumping Dengar onto his seat as Boba Fett got Neela up onto the sand, then, with a final push against the sides of the holes, collapsed against her. In all directions, the silence of the dune sea extended from them. Wearily, Dengar got to his feet and scanned across the low hills. Tilting his head back, he searched the cloudless sky, sun glare almost blinding him. There was no sign of any ships. The bombing raid that had left the desert wasteland cratered and scorched seemed effectively over, its perpetrators having removed themselves beyond the atmosphere of Tatooine. Though by this point, if they had returned, Dengar didn't feel capable of anything other than flopping on the ground and letting the explosive charges finish him off. He walked over to the other two. Boba Fett lay on his back, eyes closed. The only indication of life was the slow rise and fall of his chest. Whatever strength had been left in him was enough for basic respiratory functions and nothing else. How are you doing? Dengar's shadow fell across Neela's face. She nodded slowly. I'm okay. With the back of a begrimed hand, Neela pushed her sweat-damp hair away from her eyes. The motion left a black smear across her face. She sat up and drew her knees toward her breast so she could examine the ankle that had been pinned beneath the weight of the Sarlacc segment. A wince drew her eyes shut for a second as she poked at the bruised flesh. Nothing's broken, I don't think. Leaning against Dengar for balance, she stood upright and gingerly put her weight on the leg. Yeah, it's all right. A voice sounded out of the hole from which they had just escaped. Given the circumstances, I have just observed, called Shelby loudly, I would anticipate that medical attention is required by all parties in the immediate vicinity. Plus, the patient we had previously been attending to is undoubtedly in need of... The hectoring comments were cut short when Neela picked up a rock and tossed it down the hole. It clanked against metal and plastoid, rendering the medical droid silent for a moment. I'm not going back down there, announced Neela. I've had enough time on that line already. Dengar gave a weary sigh. As always, he supposed it was up to him. The medical droids still had their uses. For one, Shelby had been obviously right about Boba Fett needing some further attention, especially after what had drained out of him underneath the Dune Sea's surface. And there were the various supplies, bits and pieces, not much, that he and Neela had managed to carry with them from the hiding place. Those would undoubtedly come in handy, given their present exposed situation. All right, said Dengar. He looked around for the nearest boulder to which to fasten the line. But when I get done, you're both going to owe me big time. Don't worry about that, Neela smiled up at him. You'll get all the rewards that are coming to you. He wasn't sure what that meant. Even as he was clambering back down the escape route hole, the strap of the lantern clenched in his teeth. He was wondering whether those rewards would be a good or bad thing when they finally got to him. All that noise had upset the feelings. It trembled in Kuat of Kuat's arms as he stroked its silken fur. There, there, he soothed the frightened animal. It's all over now. You have nothing to worry about. That was the difference between creatures such as the Felix and the galaxy's sentient inhabitants. Go to sleep and dream whatever you want. He stood at the great viewport of the Kuat Drive Yard's flagship, watching the mottled sphere of the planet Tatooine dwindle in the distance, a clump of dirt among the hard, 
cold stars. A good part of that dirt was now in considerably more battered condition than before. The military squadron that had pounded the surface of the dune sea to dust was already en route, heading back to Kuat by a circuitous route, jumping in and out of hyperspace to foil any possible attempts at tracking and linking them to the just-concluded bombing raid on Tatooine. All insignia and identification beacons had been carefully stripped from the vessels before they had left on their mission. When word of the raid filtered through the watering holes and back alleys of Moss Eisley, and any corresponding places on other worlds, the speculation would most likely be directed toward the Empire, or possibly the Black Sun organization. That notion pleased Kuat of Kuat as he scratched behind the sighing Felix's ears. We move in secret ways, mused Kuat. The better to reach our destination. The even more pleasing notion was that Boba Fett had reached his final destination. That had been the whole point of the bombing raid. Reports of the bounty hunter's death had already reached Kuat of Kuat. Many other sentient creatures, humanoid or not, would have heard of someone going down the gullet of the Sarlacc and would have concluded that was the end of that person. Kuat of Kuat had, however, more experience with the individual in question. Boba Fett had always had an unnerving ability to show up alive, if somewhat battered, long after any ordinary man's death would have been well assured. Attention to detail made KDY the manufacturing force that it was in the galaxy, supplier of vessels to Emperor Palpatine as well as the shadowy figures that ran Black Sun. The present Kuat of Kuat had inherited the same thoroughness that had characterized his ancestors. It's not enough to know that someone is dead, he whispered to the feelings as he held the animal's luxurious fur close to his throat. You want them buried, or better yet, scattered across the landscape in little pieces. Excuse me, sir. Kuat of Kuat glanced over his shoulder and saw one of his comm supervisors. Yes. Even aboard the corporate flagship, he had no taste for the obsequious formalities that characterized Palpatine's court. KDY was a business, not a theater for monomaniacal self-aggrandizement. What is it? The damage survey has just come in. The comm supervisor held up a thin, self-contained data readout with red, glowing numbers arranged in neat rows. From the monitoring devices we left behind on Tatooine. He had been expecting those. What's the analysis? Maximum ground penetration was achieved. The comm supervisor glanced at the readout. All areas surrounding the great pit of Carcoon were effectively saturated by the bombing raid. Probability of anything on the surface of the Dune Sea or anywhere underground to a depth of 20 meters is... A few quick buttons were punched on the readout's controls. 0 0.0001. The targeted tolerance level we went in was only two zeros past the decimal point. A satisfied expression crossed the comm supervisor's face as he lowered the device. I'd say the chances are pretty good that we achieved our objective. Ah, oh. Kuat of Kuat slowly nodded. Pretty good, you say. The comm supervisor's pleased expression vanished. He was one of the younger staff members reporting directly to the heir and owner of the company. A figure of speech, sir. He still had a lot to learn. The objective was undoubtedly accomplished. That's more like it. The feelings murmured drowsily beneath Kuat of Kuat's hand. Or as undoubtedly as can be expected in this stubborn universe. He bestowed a smile on his underling. We have to play the percentages, don't we? Sir? Never mind. A sleepy protest came from the feelings as Kuat bent down and set it on the intricately tessellated floor. Thanks for the information. You can go now. The comm supervisor made his exit and Kuat of Kuat turned back to his contemplation of Tatooine now hardly more than a thumbnail-sized blot in the viewport. 
Its wordless voice, louder, the Felix rubbed against his ankles, negotiating to be picked up again. A long way to come, Kuat nodded as he murmured his thoughts aloud. Just for nothing. He didn't share the comm supervisor's certainty about what had been achieved. Being sure of everything in this universe was one of the follies of youth. Still, thought Kuat, it was worth trying. Just for the sake of thoroughness and on the off chance that Boba Fett could be killed. There was so much at stake, so many plans and schemes so deeply laid and so critical to the survival of KDY that it was worth any expenditure of time and capital to try to remove Fett from the multi-leveled game board on which the Empire's pawns advanced. There were other players in the game as well. Black Sun, the Rebellion, smaller and even less savoury empires like those of the Hutt clans and their like. But Kuat of Kuat wasn't concerned with those for the moment. The opponents didn't know, and neither did the pawn, just how important Boba Fett was in this game. Kuat of Kuat found some wry amusement in that datum. If Fett or Emperor Palpatine ever did find out, though, the game would swiftly become more serious and deadly. There would be no more heirs to Kuat drive yards because the corporation itself would cease to exist. The Emperor's scavengers would pick the bones apart like a gem-encrusted corpse. There were still a great many moves left in the game, though, before that happened. Kuat was determined to play them all. I suppose... He told the Felix, We'll be seeing him again. That had been the main reason that he had cancelled any orders for a second bombing run on Tatooine's Dune Sea. The conviction had settled in Kuat of Kuat that it was a pointless endeavour. If Boba Fett was going to be eliminated, it wasn't by any means as relatively crude as that. He'll take a good deal of killing before he's dead enough. He supposed it hadn't been a complete waste, though. Perhaps I've slowed him down. There would be time to shift a few other pieces into position, to contemplate the game board and devise strategies for it. The Felix had waited long enough. Now it impatiently informed its master so. Soon enough, Kuat of Kuat cradled the animal in the crook of his arm again and idly scratched the spot behind its ears that it liked best. A little time, perhaps, but it won't be long. It never was when it came to dealing with Boba Fett. Just as before, on another part of the board, when the pawns had been creatures such as that wretched spidery assembler Kadama Bat and the Bounty Hunters Guild, that game, Kuat knew had played out with fatal speed. Not long, murmured Kuat of Kuat again. Not long at all. And there we have it. Chapter 13 over. So, we this is interesting. So, Kuat of Kuat is aware of the conspiracy that is going on in the past, in the past sections of the book, with the Bounty Hunters Guild but doesn't seem to necessarily be a central figure in that. So there is a secondary thing happening. I was also quite interested by... Now, I believe the book said that the events that we see are taking just shortly after the events of the Return of the Jedi. Now, it seems that either this is a point where, say, news of the Emperor has been defeated and hasn't gotten there yet, or that this is some point between the actions of Jabba's barge and the defeat of the Emperor. I'd be interested to know which one it is. Some of you who know the timeline better than me might be able to tell me. If you can, please do say so in the comments. Now, I've quite enjoyed this. This has been much more action-oriented and much more um, dynamic than uh, in the last part we had a lot of conversation, and particularly with Prince Zizor and the Emperor. Whereas here, we finally got ourselves a bit more Dengar, uh, as had been requested earlier on. Um, it'd be nice to have some more Dengar, and we got it, although we still haven't seen Manaru yet, and I would quite like to meet the character and see what she's like. Do you know much about Manaru? Let me know. In the meantime, it's time for us to end this episode. 
So I will see you next week when uh, episode six of The Book of Boba Fett comes out and we will release part six of The Mandalorian Armor audiobook. Until then, my friends, please like this video if you've enjoyed it and particularly share it with your friends. Anyone else who will enjoy an audiobook, please let them know that this is here waiting for them on YouTube. And if you're super liking us, go ahead and subscribe and hit that bell icon. That way, YouTube will reward us and let you know when we put out a new video. Until then, you can see me on Sunday in the Fulcrum Entertainment Podcast, or I'll see you next week. Bye!